Well, this evening we will continue our study in the 2000 Baptist Faith and Message. We are talking about evangelism and missions. This will be part two, the final part of this section. We began with Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission, and really broke that passage down. And what an incredibly powerful passage that is at the end of Matthew's gospel. Now, this evening, I want to ask the question, can a person be saved without hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ? And the reason that I ask this question is because... It is so common to hear people claim that a person has been saved without hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. The answer of Scripture to this question is emphatically no. There is no other way for a person to be saved without hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if a person does not hear the gospel, that person will perish in their sin. They cannot otherwise be saved I've heard this many times claimed where, and I don't doubt that, that this has happened, that people have maybe had some sort of dream and, and, and somehow in that dream, you know, they see a, a man and they believe that man was Jesus and then later a missionary comes to them and they say, oh, well, that's the person that I saw in the dream, this Jesus that you're telling me about. I don't doubt those stories. I have no way to verify those dreams, obviously. Those are subjective, but I will say, I don't doubt that that happened, but whether truly they had a dream where God was kind of showing them this, the point is, is that a missionary went and shared the gospel with them and they were saved through the gospel that that missionary shared with them. They were not saved apart from someone going to them and telling them the gospel. And then also I, I've heard preachers recently, uh, in, in, and I've heard this in you know revivalistic circles where preachers say things like, you know, all these people have been saved and, and, and they didn't even open a Bible. You know, the Holy Spirit started moving and, and, and they didn't even have to preach out of the Bible. Or I've seen preachers do this. You know, they get into the pulpit and they say, well, I had a message prepared, but they set their Bible aside. But God's told me to tell you this. And they go off into something else. Um, I, I want to tell you that unless the message comes out of this book, it is not <laughs> the word of God. Um, and that people are not saved apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is found in this book. Now, you can summarize the gospel in this book. If you ask me what is the gospel, I will say, well, it is that God created all things perfect, uh, sinless. Uh, everything was very good. Then man fell in sin. Man rebelled against God. Man uh, did not obey the Lord in his sin and rebellion, brought death and disease and destruction into the world. But God did not leave us in that condition. He sent his own son, Jesus Christ, to live a perfect sinless life, die upon the cross, pay for our sins. And anyone who turns from their sin, trusting Christ for salvation and follows him, they are forgiven, made righteous, made perfect because of the sinless life that Jesus lived for them and because Jesus paid for their sin upon the cross. They are saved once they come to faith in Christ. And one day at the end of history, Christ will come again to this earth he will raise the living and the dead. Um, they will be transformed in a moment. Unbelievers will be cast into the lake of fire. Believers will inherit eternal life and reign with Christ forever in the new heavens and the new earth. That is the gospel in less than 60 seconds. But what I just gave you is a summary of what's found in this book. But there is no other gospel than what's in this book. And you're not rightly sharing the gospel unless you got it from here. There is no other source of the gospel. This is it. And so I want to ask the question tonight, can a person be saved apart from hearing the gospel? And I'm going to show you that clearly the answer of Scripture is no, they cannot. And so while many people claim otherwise... If the answer to that were yes, I just want to say this, then evangelism and missions would not be the only way for people to be saved. If people could be saved without hearing the gospel, um, then, then maybe we don't need to fund evangelism and missions and, and do those things. But of course we do, and of course Scripture commands us to do them. I've even heard people say things like, well, well you know, what about people in a faraway country? They've never heard the gospel and you know, they are good people, they're, they're kind, they're, you know, they, they, they love others. Uh, 
Um, what happens to them if they've never heard the gospel? What happens to them when they die? And my answer is the same thing that every other sinner deserves. But you see, the question itself about these good people in a faraway country right there reveals to me a lack of understanding of Scripture. Romans chapter 3, verse 10 says, There is none good, not even one. No one seeks after God. We all, like sheep, have gone astray, each to his own ways. <laughs> there are not good people in a faraway country. There are lost sinners in a faraway country who will perish without the gospel of Jesus Christ. They might be kind people, but they are rebels against God, just like you and I, who need to be saved. And so, I'm going to demonstrate from Scripture tonight that the gospel of Jesus Christ and someone going and bringing the gospel to a person is the only way that they can be saved. Another instance where I hear this that drives me up the wall, you know, they, they, you, you'll see this meme out there on social media, you know, preach the gospel often and if necessary, use words. <laughs> there is no other way to preach the gospel than with words, okay? Now, should your life be consistent with what you say you believe? Of course. But you're gonna, not going to nice someone into the kingdom of heaven. You're going to have to tell them about their sin and their need of the Savior. I mean, at some point, you're going to have to explain who Jesus is, what he has done, and what they must do in light of this truth. So... Preach the gospel often, and it's always necessary to use words. Okay, that's what it should say. There is no other way, and I will show you this from Scripture. Let's go to everyone's favorite Old Testament prophet, Ezekiel. I once preached verse by verse through the book of Ezekiel. I maintain that it is the most difficult book in the Bible to preach through. I did it in the years 2009 and 10. That is some time ago. I would probably do a much better job than I did 15 years ago. But I was an aspiring young pastor of a small church in rural Texas, and I just decided I'm going to preach verse by verse through Ezekiel. And I did it in about two years, and I learned a lot. And this passage, more than any other passage in Ezekiel, stuck out to me, and I've never forgotten it. Ezekiel chapter 3, beginning in verse 16. You remember John 3.16. I would encourage you to remember Ezekiel 3.16. It is also a profound passage of Scripture. The context here, by the way, is that Ezekiel has been called to be a prophet while the people of God have gone into exile in the nation of Babylon. And the reason that they've been exiled is because the people of Israel and Judah have worshipped other gods... They have turned away from the true God. And now Ezekiel is called to go to them and proclaim to a stubborn and rebellious people who have worshipped other gods that they need to repent of serving other gods and be faithful to the Lord God alone, the God of Scripture, the only true God. And so he is being called by God to go and preach the gospel to his own people who are prisoners and slaves in Babylon and as he is to go there and preach the gospel God warns them about how rebellious and stubborn the people will be but he tells him that that's no excuse even though people will not want to hear this message even though people will be offended and get upset with you when you tell them this message Ezekiel you have a responsibility to tell others this message, Ezekiel 3, verse 16. And at the end of seven days, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man. I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Now, I just want to say real quickly, this word watchman, it is a word that's typically used to speak of someone who would be on the walls of a fortified city and he would be out there, especially at night, although 24 hours a day, but especially at night, the watchman would have to stay awake and look for anyone who might come and try to attack the city. So uh, Psalm 127, one of my favorite psalms, um, uh, says um, that 
It is in vain, uh, unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. So Psalm 127 says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain, which is to say, the watchman's job is to keep watch over the city while the people sleep at night and make sure no one attacks the city while the people inside are asleep. But Psalm 127 reminds us that ultimately God alone can protect our, our home, right? Um, the best security alarm system in the world, the best police force in the world, the best army in the world is not going to protect you unless ultimately God protects you. And yet nonetheless, we, we see here that the watchman who is to guard over a city and when the enemy might come and invade, that is used in a spiritual sense for the calling of Ezekiel as a prophet. He is a watchman over the city. So, so what is the idea here of calling Ezekiel a watchman over the city? over the people of God, because spiritually they are under attack. And the watchman's job, when he sees danger in the middle of the night and all the people are asleep, is to turn around and blow the trumpet and shout, there's danger, get up, it's time to fight. The watchman would be derelict in his duty if he saw the enemy coming to attack and did nothing. And so God uses this metaphor for the responsibility of Ezekiel and by extension every one of us to be a watchman on the wall who sees the attacks of an unbelieving world and warns other people about the spiritual danger and the only hope of salvation. So he says in verse 17, Son of man... I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. Let's just take that command right there. You hear a word from God, tell others that word. Brothers and sisters, do we have a word from God? Amen. Right here in this book. So that clearly means God has given us his word in the 66 books of this Bible... We have a responsibility to tell others his word. Very simple, and yet so few people obey this command. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. Verse 18, if I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning nor speak to warm the wicked from his wicked way in order to save his life, that wicked person shall die for his iniquity. But his blood I will require at your hand. The Lord begins here in verse 18 by answering the hypothetical question of, well, what about the person in a faraway country who's never heard the gospel? If they die without hearing the gospel, do they get to go to heaven? And the answer here is emphatically no. He says, if you do not warn the wicked man, and all people are sinners. We're all wicked, okay? There's no one who's good. So he says, if you do not warn the wicked man from his wicked way in order to save his life, and the Hebrew word here is nephesh, and it's sometimes translated soul. It's kind of wrapped up both in the concept of physical and spiritual life. It's almost inseparable. So whereas in the New Testament, you have different words to speak of physical and spiritual life, suke and zoe in in the Greek language. In in Hebrew, there's one word, nephesh, and it it kind of means both at the same time. And so uh, save his life, save his soul, which is it? It's kind of both, really, the, the way this Hebrew word is used. Meaning, look, sin can bring both judgment now and for eternity, right? I mean, sin can destroy your life today, and it can also send you to an eternity in hell. And I I think God is implying both here, right? And so he says here, If you do not warn the wicked man in his wicked way in order to save his life, that wicked person shall die for his iniquity. Listen, if no one warns them, they will perish in their sin. 
Now, some people don't like that, but look, look, that's what the Word of God says. And if that's not true, why do we send missionaries around the world anyways, right? If we have a theology that says, well, if a person has never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and dies without hearing the gospel, they automatically get into heaven because God grades on a, grades on a curve. If that's our theology, then the worst thing we could do is send them a missionary because then they might hear the gospel and reject it. But that's not what the Bible says. That's the way some people think. I've heard preachers say those very words. Well-known, popular preachers. But that's not what the Word of God says here, is it? If God has given us His Word and we fail to warn the wicked person in his wicked way in order to save his soul, that wicked person shall die for his iniquity. But then look at what God says. But his blood I will require at your hand. Now that's language used throughout the Old Testament uh, case law as it deals with murder and manslaughter. And requiring someone's blood at your hand means if you had a part in someone committing an act of murder, it's being like an accessory to murder. So in the Old Testament case law, if someone committed murder and you helped them do it, not only could, should they receive the death penalty, but you very well could as well because you helped them commit murder. You may not have been the trigger man or the hatchet man, but you helped them do it, and therefore you can both be put to death. And the language that the Old Testament uses for that is God requiring their blood at your hand. Right? You're an accessory to the act. And God uses it spiritually here to say, listen, this person is spiritually going to perish. You have the only gospel that can save them. And if you withhold that gospel from them and they perish, God is going to hold you responsible for not sharing the truth with them. Now imagine that a scientist somewhere next year discovers the cure for cancer. And that scientist says, you know, I could tell the world about this cure for cancer, but I own a pharmaceutical company and we make a lot of money treating cancer. Maybe I ought to just keep it a secret. I could save a lot of lives, but I could also make a lot of money. What would you say? Well, some people believe this has already happened. I, I'm not one of those conspiracy theorists, but let's just hypothetically say that sometime in the future this happened, okay? What would you say about a man who discovered the cure for cancer but decided to keep it a secret so that he could share drugs that treat cancer rather than sharing the cure? That's an evil man, isn't it? Brothers and sisters, everyone in this world has a spiritual cancer called sin. And we have the perfect cure. And if we withhold the cure from those people who are perishing in their sin, we are evil. How much do you have to hate a person to believe that hell is a literal place of fire and torment as the scriptures teach and then not tell them how they can be saved from that place? It's not loving to tell people who are living in a sinful and wicked lifestyle, whatever that lifestyle is. And today the culture and many churches, so-called churches, want to excuse people as they live in, lifestyle of, in a lifestyle of premarital sex or adultery or homosexuality or transgenderism or you name the sin. That's okay. God accepts you just the way you are. You don't have to repent of that. Listen, how much do you have to hate a person? Seriously. How much do you have to hate a person to know that they're going to hell, but you don't want them to get upset at you when you hurt their feelings and tell them, take this cure. It'll taste bad, but it'll save your soul. It might hurt your feelings, but it'll save your soul. And you say to yourself, well, I don't want anybody to get mad at me, so I'll let them perish for eternity in hell rather than make them upset at me. How selfish. And is that not the very calculation that many of us have made? I say it having been guilty of doing the same thing myself. 
God is commanding Ezekiel not to do that here. Ezekiel, you have to tell them. And if you don't tell them, God says, their soul will perish and I will require their blood at your hand. Their blood will be on your hands, Ezekiel, because you could have given them the gospel that would have saved their soul. Verse 19. But if you warn the wicked, Ezekiel, if you do what I'm calling you to do, and you proclaim this gospel, if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die for his iniquity. But you will have, had, will have delivered your soul. Now notice here, the unbeliever has the same eternal destination regardless of if he heard the gospel and rejected it or never heard the gospel at all. But for the Christian, if we don't share the gospel with them, God's going to punish us and hold us accountable for not sharing that gospel. And if we do share it, we will have delivered our souls. Now you might ask the question here, wait, I thought we were saved by grace and not by works. Are you telling me that I can be a saved, born-again Christian and lose my salvation because I don't share the gospel with people? No, that's not what I'm telling you. I'm telling you that if you are a saved, born-again Christian, you will share the gospel with other people. And as Charles Spurgeon said, there are two types of Christians, missionaries and imposters. What am I saying? There is no such thing as a Christian who does not share his or her faith. What do you think Jesus meant when he said, if any man is ashamed of me and my gospel in this wicked and adulterous generation, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes into his Father's glory. What do you think Jesus meant when he said that? He's saying, those who truly know me will tell others about me. And those who are unwilling to tell others about me never knew me to begin with. I'm not saying you earn your way into heaven by sharing the gospel with other people. I'm telling you that if you've really been born again and saved, and you've been given the cure to spiritual cancer, you will be willing to share that cure with other people. This doesn't get preached much in most churches. <clears throat> but this is exactly what the Word of God tells us. We need to hear this. This is clearly the testimony of Scripture. Verse 20, continuing in Ezekiel 3, verse 20. Again, if a righteous person turns from his righteousness and commits injustice... And I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Now here the righteous person is going to describe someone who appears to be walking in covenant faithfulness to God. This is ancient Israel. They were under a covenant with God, the Mosaic Covenant, the Old Covenant as we call it, or the Old Testament, which is just the Latin term for Old Covenant. And so, <clears throat> they appear to be a believer... But they turn from their righteousness and commit injustice. They apostatize. They walk away from the faith. I'm not saying that they were ever truly saved, but we couldn't tell that they were a false convert. So to all appearances, they seem to be a believer. They seem to be someone who loved the Lord and followed Him. But eventually, they turned away and committed injustice, which implies here a total wholesale rejection of the faith. And God says, and if I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Interesting here that this often happens as a result of a stumbling block. And I won't go into this too much, but this is where God has basically required something of this person that revealed that they were not willing to give that thing up in order to have God. It was some sin they're unwilling to repent of. He shall die. Because you have not warned him, he shall die for his sin, and his righteous deeds that he has done shall not be remembered, but his blood I will require at your hands. We have a responsibility to warn wayward professing believers. In the New Testament, this is called church discipline. 
This is what is spoken of by Jesus when he talks about the 99 sheep and the one goes astray and the shepherd goes after the straying sheep. We are to plead with them to return. We have that responsibility. And if we don't plead with them, God will hold us accountable for being silent. Verse 21, but if you warn the righteous person not to sin, if you plead with this professing believer, don't do that. Come back to the faith. If you warn the righteous person not to sin and he does not sin, if he repents, he shall surely live. The goal of church discipline is not to kick people out of the church, but to to help people to repent. And by the way, we all need that, okay? Listen, not one of us is a perfect Christian, okay? We're all going to mess up and we need to lovingly and graciously say, brother, sister, let's make this right. Don't we? And so this is what we must do for one another. Even in the small things, even when we lose our temper, we need to say, I've done the same thing myself, but that's still sin, and we need to repent and make this right. And so if if he turns from his sin, he shall surely live because he took warning, and you will have delivered your soul. Notice the same outcome for you. Whether the sinner repents or not, the same outcome for you. If you share the gospel, if you warn the person who is straying from the truth, or if you warn the the unbeliever, whether they profess to be a believer or not, it doesn't matter, same thing for both situations. If you warn them, that's all God has asked you to do. Listen, do you know what success in ministry looks like? Faithfulness. Do you know what success as a Christian looks like? Faithfulness. Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel are three prophets who had very few converts. In fact, we don't know of Jeremiah having any converts. God didn't call them to be successful. They didn't have a lot of numbers to count, brothers and sisters. If the, if the numbers, the number of, of people that you can say that, that, that were saved under your ministry is the mark of success, then Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel would be abysmal failures. Just read those books of the Bible. Most people rejected their message. But they were faithful prophets of God. Listen, whether or not the person repents, that is the work of the Spirit of God. You do not have control of other people's hearts. This should be liberating to you. God has called you to share the gospel with people, not to repent for them. If they will not hear the gospel and believe, that is not on you. Look at what it says here. If they don't believe, it's on them, not on you. If they do believe, they'll be saved and God will reward you for your faithfulness. Regardless, we have a responsibility to share this gospel. Verse 24, And the hand of the Lord was upon me there. And he said to me, Arise, go into the valley, and there I will speak with you. So I arose and went into the valley, and behold, the glory of the Lord stood there, like the glory that I had seen by the Kabar Canal, and I fell on my face. But the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, And he spoke with me and said to me, Go shut yourself within the house. And you, O son of man, behold, cords will be placed upon you, and you shall be bound with them so that you cannot go out among the people. And I will make your tongue cling to the roof of your mouth so that you shall be mute and unable to reprove them, for they are a rebellious house. God says, Ezekiel, you're going to go to them, and they're not going to listen. Try being that missionary. Where God sends you to a people and says, and by the way, they're not going to listen. But I still want you to go. So listen. Do not judge the faithfulness of a Christian, an evangelist, a missionary, a pastor, based on the numbers. The numbers are up to God. Judge the quality of their ministry based on their faithfulness to do what God has commanded them to do. Results are in the hands of God. 
We simply obey and leave the rest up to the Lord. God says in verse 26, And I will make your tongue cling to the roof of your mouth so that you shall be mute and unable to reprove them, for they are a rebellious house. But when I speak with you, I will open your mouth and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord, Who will hear, let him hear. And he who will refuse to hear, let him refuse, for they are a rebellious house. Now Sunday I gave away what happens later in chapter 37. Ezekiel has a revival in a graveyard. And if you haven't read Ezekiel 37 yet, you need to go home and read it. It's incredible. But the beginning of the book, this is what it's like. He goes and proclaims the gospel to people who don't want to hear it. Now let's go to the New Testament. We will go to what is really a quintessential passage for this truth. Romans chapter 10. And I do want to kind of explain this passage And I want to say this generously, but I I want to explain this passage in more depth and context than I usually hear in most pulpits. Because what often happens in Romans chapter 10 is you'll hear someone simply quote chapter 10, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And a lot of times what a preacher will say is, look... If you will just say the words, Jesus is Lord, and you believe that he died on the cross, was buried and rose from the grave, then you're saved. That is not what Romans 10, 9 is saying. That is not all that is required for a person to be saved. Faith is not, oh yeah, I think those things are true, and I'll repeat these words in a prayer. That's not even close. So I'm going to explain what is being said in Romans chapter 10 in its appropriate context. And you will see that the faith that is called here is a faith where we are called to give up everything to follow Jesus Christ and to lay our lives down to follow him. Let's begin in Romans 10 verse 1. Speaking of his Jewish kinsmen... Brothers, my, heart desire, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. So Paul is speaking of his fellow Jews who have rejected Christ. And he, he tells us, he, he started telling us this in chapter 9, that he has this great desire to see them saved and come to faith in Christ. Verse 2, For I bear witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They... They are a pious people, they pray, they do all these religious things, but they don't understand the true gospel. They have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Listen, there are a lot of sincere lost people in this world. One of the most heartbreaking things is a person who is is sincerely committed to a false religion. I've known a lot of sincere Buddhists, Sincere Hindus, sincere Mormons, sincere Jehovah's Witnesses. And it breaks my heart because they have a zeal. And they're doing all that they know to do, but it's not according to knowledge. A false gospel will not save you no matter how dedicated you are to it. Paul is talking about unbelieving Jews who are very dedicated to the wrong message and in fact they had not understood the Old Testament message it was not one of work salvation but it was one that pointed to the pointed to the cross of Christ as he will say in the next few verses verse 3 for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own they did not submit to God's righteousness now I kind of have to almost summarize the book of Romans, when I say this, so I'm just going to briefly say, the righteousness of God in the book of Romans, this Greek phrase, dikaia sune theu, this phrase, the righteousness of God, is used in Romans and Galatians in particular, but Paul's writings, as a technical theological term for how a person is saved. And here's what he means. The righteousness of God means what we call the doctrine of justification. And it means this, that when the sinner 
places their faith in Christ, the perfect, sinless, spotless righteousness of Jesus Christ is given to them. We call this imputed righteousness. The, the, the righteous Christ that Jesus lived on our behalf is credited to us, spiritually speaking, before our God and our judge through faith in Jesus so that the sinner is counted righteous, so that we are totally forgiven of our sins. And when God looks at the believer in Jesus Christ, he does not see the sins of our past, but he sees the perfect sinless life that Jesus lived on our behalf, where he kept the law for us without ever sinning. That is what Paul means by the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God that is by faith in Jesus Christ. And so Paul has been building this idea in the first nine chapters of Romans, and so that's kind of a quick summary of what's happened up to this point in the book. So Paul says in verse 3 that the unbelieving Jews, that is Jews who have rejected Jesus, they are ignorant of the righteousness of God. They don't realize that the way to be right with God is through faith in Jesus, not through trying to keep the law and earning their way to heaven. <coughs> They seek to establish their own righteousness through works. And the problem with works righteousness is it doesn't work because you're not righteous, you're a sinner. You can't earn your way to heaven. Your good works won't get you to heaven because you don't have any. You need a savior. You don't need to be a better you. You need someone to save you and change you. You cannot do this for yourself. And they did not understand that. He says they did not submit to God's righteousness. They would not confess their own sin and their own ability to make themselves righteous before God. And unless you confess your sins and come to Christ for forgiveness, you cannot be saved. That's what Paul is saying. Look at verse 4. This is profound. I had a professor, Dr. Jason Meyer, who wrote an entire book, a couple hundred pages on this one verse. And it's that good of a verse. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now the word here in the Greek language for the end of the law is the Greek word telos. Telos is... A word um, in philosophy, if you study teleology, it's like, what's the ultimate purpose? What's the ultimate goal? That's what teleology is, the study of ultimate meaning and the goal of everything. What is life about? What's the meaning of life? Telos is a word. <clears throat> he doesn't mean here, as some read this, because we're reading it in an English translation, he doesn't mean like Christ is where the law stops, like the end of the line. That's not what he's talking about. That's not what this Greek word means. That's kind of true in a sense, but that's not what Paul's saying here. That's not his point, okay? The law doesn't like not matter anymore after the cross. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is Christ is the goal of the law, the purpose of the law. He's not saying that Christ abolish the law, he's saying that Christ fulfilled the law. And Jesus says this in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. He said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. He's not the end of the law in the sense of he, he ripped up the Old Testament and threw it away. No. He's the end of the law in the sense of you look at the Old Testament, you go, that's about Jesus. All those books in the Old Testament were pointing to him. It was all about him the whole time. That's what this word, the end of the law, means. The goal, the purpose. What it was all about to begin with. Christ is the end of the law. The, the ultimate purpose of the law. For righteousness to everyone who believes. When you understand who Christ is, you receive righteousness through believing in him. And this word believing, pistuo, to have faith. It, it is a word that means to totally entrust your life, and everything that you are to him. Now in verse 5, Paul says, and he's quoting here from Deuteronomy chapter 30, 
he quotes Moses, and he says, For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandment shall live by them. So Moses explained, in, in, especially in Deuteronomy, he said, Obey and you will be blessed, disobey and you will be cursed. Here's God's law, Ten Commandments. Just do them and don't break them. Well, have you broken any of the Ten Commandments? Of course you have. And if you say you haven't, you're breaking the one that says do not lie. So he gave us a law and says, here's God's standard, perfect righteousness. Don't ever sin. Problem is, not one of us have met that standard except for Jesus. So verse 6, but the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. Now here's what he's saying. The righteousness based on faith doesn't say, what do I have to do to earn my way to heaven? Or what do I have to do to go down into the abyss and defeat Satan and evil? He's saying you're not good enough to get to heaven and you're not strong enough to defeat Satan, okay? <laughs> you can't. You're not good enough and you can't save yourself. <clears throat> but what does it say, verse 8? Quoting Deuteronomy 30, But the word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Now here in the Greek, the word translated word of faith, it's, it's the Greek term rhema, and it means the spoken message. So he's talking about the, the message that we proclaim. He's talking about the gospel. The, the message that we share to others about how they can be saved. The word of faith. Or the gospel. Right? It, this, is, this is telling people how they can be saved. The word, the, 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 the message of salvation, it's near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. You don't need to be good enough to get to heaven or go down to hell and defeat Satan you need to believe the gospel that's the only way you're going to be saved that's the only way you'll get to heaven and then he says in verse 9 because here's how simple it is if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved let me just say something about Romans 10 9 we read this as 21st century Americans, and we have no idea what Paul is speaking about. Now, you might remember this when I was preaching through Jude, and I explained what this phrase, Jesus is Lord, is. But I won't ask anyone to raise their hand and explain it. I'll explain it for the few people in the room who don't remember my sermon from six months ago. Jesus is Lord. Kaiser Curios was the phrase that was uttered in the Roman Empire. Paul uses a different phrase here, Iesu Curios. Kaiser Curios, what all Roman, uh, not only citizens, but those who were under Roman rule had to confess is that Caesar is Lord, Kaiser Curios in Greek. What they would have to do is they would be marched into one of the pagan temples, they would have to take a pinch of incense throw it into the fire in the altar in the pagan temple and utter the phrase Kaiser Curios, which is to say Caesar is a god and I worship him. That's what it meant to say Kaiser Curios. It was to worship the god that the ruler of Rome was supposed to be. To utter the phrase Kaiser Curios is idolatry. It is to claim that there is another god than the one true living god of scripture. You could not utter the phrase Kaiser Curios without renouncing your faith in Jesus. The problem was if you wouldn't do that when they marched you into the temple, they would incarcerate you, beat you, whip you, and if you never gave in, they would eventually throw you to the lions, cut your head off, burn you alive. They had a lot of ways of killing you in ancient Rome, crucify you. All you had to do was... Throw the pinch of incense in the fire and say, Kaiser Curios. But you know what the early Christians did? By the tens of thousands, and if you read the history books, you'll find out that they paid with their lives for this. They were marched into the temple. They were told to throw the pinch of incense into the fire, and they stood there and, and they said, no. Iesu Curios. Jesus is Lord. And they said Jesus is Lord 
and they would not back down. And tens of thousands of Christians in the first century were murdered by the Roman Empire because they refused to say Caesar is Lord. Instead, they said Jesus is Lord. So when you read Romans 10, 9, and it says, here's how you are saved, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, understand that he's writing to people in the city of Rome. This is the book to the Romans. He's writing to people who very well will be marched into that temple and commanded to utter the phrase Caesar is Lord, and they will have to say... Jesus is Lord, and they know that they're going to be killed for it. So no, he is not talking about repeating the words in the sinner's prayer. He's talking about a faith in Christ where you say, I will die if I have to to follow Jesus. I will give up everything to follow this Savior. Caesar is not Lord. Jesus alone is Lord. So he says here, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and no one else is, even if it costs you your life. And if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, if you believe the truths of the gospel, you will be saved. Well, it means a whole lot more than most people think it means, doesn't it? It is a beautiful verse, and it does teach the doctrine of justification by faith alone. But that faith, though salvation is free, it will cost you everything. You understand that? If you're going to follow Jesus, that means you must lay down everything else to follow him, even if you have to lay down your life to do it. Verse 10. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Remember, he's writing to people who likely will be killed for saying Jesus is Lord. And he says, but look, if they kill you, you go to heaven. Just keep that in mind. You will not be put to shame. Remember where your soul is going if they kill your body. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same kurios, the same Lord, is Lord of all. He says, Jesus is Lord of all, even those Romans who want to kill you for believing in Jesus. So he's reminding us, the people who might execute you for your faith in Christ, they're going to answer to Jesus on the day of judgment. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And the idea of calling on the name of the Lord here, he's quoting from the prophet Habakkuk. But but understand here in this context, the idea of calling, he's quoting from Joel 2.32. But the idea of, of calling on the name of the Lord here is they tell you you have to pronounce your loyalty to Caesar and you are to call on the name of the Lord in that moment. Now look at verse 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? Well, you you can't call on a Savior that you don't believe in. And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? Well, how can you believe in Jesus if no one's ever told you about him? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And this word preaching, by the way, it means caruso, to proclaim good news. It doesn't mean like the pastor preaching from the pulpit. You could just, it means proclaim good news. He's talking about evangelism. So it includes pastors preaching from the pulpit, but it includes you as a Christian sharing the gospel with your neighbor. The word means to proclaim the good news. So how will they hear the gospel if someone doesn't tell them the gospel? And you realize what the answer is, right? They won't. Unless someone goes and tells them the gospel, they won't ever get to hear the gospel. But the problem is, the gospel is the only way they can be saved. And how are they to preach unless they are sent? Well, who sends them out? God through his churches. This is calling on churches to be faithful in supporting evangelism and missions. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. They bring the gospel to the lost that they can be saved. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, 
Who has believed what he has heard from us? You know, when you share this gospel, not everyone's going to believe. Have you experienced that before? (laughs) Some people reject Christ when they hear about him. You're not alone. But look at what he says in verse 17. So faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of Christ. Tell that to someone next time they tell you that they preach the gospel without words. Romans 10, 17 says, no, to preach the gospel, you have to use words. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And again, the Greek word here, word is rhema, the spoken message. So a literal translation is faith comes by hearing and hearing by the spoken message about Christ. He is emphasizing here that this is something that you have to tell people. You have to go to them And you have to tell them about Jesus or they can't be saved. So why are evangelism and missions necessary? Because it's the only way that sinners can be saved. How are they to hear unless someone preaches to them? And how are they to preach unless the church sends them and supports them and is faithful to train them and call them and send them out. This is why evangelism and missions is so critical. It is what Christ has called us to do on this earth until he comes again. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for your word, and I thank you for each one here. And Lord, how I ask tonight that you would help us to be faithful in obeying your word and what we've read. Forgive us for when we have not shared this gospel as we should, and Help us to be faithful in the days ahead, not only individually to share the gospel, because we all need to do that, but also as a church to continue to faithfully support evangelism and missions in this community and to the ends of the earth. And God, we trust that you will grant fruit and that you will bring a harvest of souls. We ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.